A hierarchy of educational qualifications might look something a bit like this, with elementary or primary school at the bottom, stretching past degrees and undergraduates to graduates and PhD level. Now I'm currently studying for a PhD in atmospheric physics, and I thought it might be interesting to look at how you go from the bottom of this ladder to the top rung, and then graduating and stepping off of it. So here's how you get a PhD in five easy steps. Step number one, get yourself a degree in a relevant subject. Here's one I made earlier. The key foundation to doing a PhD is undergraduate study in a particular subject. So I'm studying atmospheric physics for my PhD, I did a degree in physics. Now most people who go on to do a PhD will do an undergraduate, a three-year course, and then a graduate course, like a master's. Not everybody does, in fact I know a girl personally who went straight on to a PhD after a three-year BA, but most people will do a master's course. Now I was a bit different because I did a four-year undergraduate which was um, integrated masters, so I have an MPhys rather than a, a BA or a BSc. But like I say, most people will do an undergraduate and then a separate graduate qualification. This is for the UK, by the way. In the US, they have a different thing like uh, undergrad and then grad school. Um, I don't know anything about that, so I'm only going to talk about the UK system. Sorry if you're expecting American stuff. It's also worth mentioning that while some people will do undergraduate and graduate degrees in slightly different fields to what they do their PhD on, the vast, vast majority will follow some kind of progression. So I did my undergraduate degree in physics, my master's year of that course, the final year, was spent on theoretical and atmospheric physics, and then I moved on to a PhD in theoretical atmospheric physics. Step number two, find yourself a supervisor or a project. Here's one I found earlier. Now this is where things are a bit different for humanities and sciences. I'm a scientist, so in the sciences, the way that it worked for me was I browsed through a bunch of projects that were being offered by different universities. So I applied to a couple of different universities, went through their uh, list of projects they were offering in the atmospheric physics departments, and picked what I thought was interesting. There was a supervisor associated with those projects, and it was that supervisor that interviewed me, um, much like an undergraduate degree, but a bit more focused on the project rather than sort of me solving problems. It was a discussion about what the project was going to entail. And then the supervisor who gets final say over whether I'm the student that gets to do that project. Now in the sciences, that project normally has funding associated with it. So there are research councils, for example, like NERC, uh, who fund a lot of science PhDs in the atmospheric sciences. Um, and there's a stipend associated with that, so you don't have to work during your degree. In the humanities, things aren't quite as rosy. For some students, it's a similar kind of thing where you apply for a project, but more often than not, you have to get funding together yourself. This isn't something that I have a huge amount of experience with, but the gist that I understand is that you do ap uh, apply to research councils. It won't be NERC, it will be the equivalent for history or art or whatever it is you wish to study. Then generally, you will track down a supervisor ask them if you can do a particular project that you've devised, and then there's an interview and a debate about whether you get to do the project or not. Most people will have more than one supervisor, generally one main supervisor, and then like a backup or a secondary supervisor who just kind of looks at things from afar and gives advice where necessary. But some people will have a whole team of supervisors. One or many though, you do need a supervisor in order to get a PhD. Step number three, you must perform some original research. Now there are two key parts to that sentence. You must perform the research and the research must be original, innovative, new. It's not enough to simply rehash what somebody else did in a scientific paper and reframe it. You have to take what other people have done and expand on what they've done or suggest the new idea and test it. Or maybe show how what people have done in the past was incorrect and show why and how it's incorrect, ideally then presenting some new idea about how it is done instead. So in my PhD, the research group that I'm part of, we have this hypothesis, which as part of my PhD, I took mathematically framed, and I'm in the middle of testing to see whether the hypothesis sticks and, and explains the data or not. So while the idea may not be original to me, it's, it's original to the research group, I'm the person that mathematically formulated it, that did the analysis, that presented something that hadn't been done before. Side note, it doesn't actually matter if you're right or not. The important thing is that you performed original research. It doesn't actually matter if your hypothesis was correct or incorrect, it's still adding to human knowledge, because in the future people will say, well, we know it's not this. So it's still a valuable contribution. He tells himself, anticipating that his PhD is full of things that are wrong. <laughs> Step number four, you must then write up this new innovative research in a PhD thesis. The plural of which, incidentally, is PhD theses, and I'm in my fourth year and that's still funny. <laughs> A thesis is basically the essay to end all essays. Even if you choose to stay in academia, you will never write anything like a thesis again. A thesis is anything between 120 to, well actually there's no upper limit, but generally like 100 to 200, maybe 300 pages. 
In that, you present the work that you've done in context. So generally, you have a first chapter where you introduce the problem you're looking at. You then have a second chapter, which is like a literature review, uh, giving background about what you're doing. And then you have a couple of chapters explaining what it is that you've done. And then at the end, like any good essay, you have a conclusion. And of course, a bibliography. The bibliography can be vast. I read a thesis the other day where it was about 20 pages long, and really quite small text. Generally speaking, you write the thesis at the end of your PhD after you've done a whole bunch of work. Well, actually, that's in an ideal world, because most of the time you write bits of your thesis as you go along, which you then completely scrap, and at the end of your PhD you kind of rewrite it again, and then you're constantly updating it as you keep doing more experiments or keep finding new readings if you're a humanities student, until it's like some Frankenstein monster of what you planned and just bits that you kind of cobbled along along the way. One of your supervisor's key jobs is to make sure that your thesis is in line with what the examiners, more on that in a second, will expect from you. So your thesis is kind of like your write-up of everything you've done over the three to four years in the UK that you spend on your PhD. And then, step five, you defend your thesis in a PhD viva. A viva can be thought of as the exam at the end of your PhD, but it's not really like that. It's a defence of what you do. You defend your thesis in a viva. The point of it is to make sure that the work that you've done is up to scratch, that you completed the work and that you can answer questions about it, and that you basically haven't plagiarised it from somewhere else. The way that this is done is that you have two examiners, normally a internal and an external examiner. Now the internal examiner is someone from your university who isn't a specialist in your field, who's basically there to make sure that um, you and the external examiner play by the rules of your particular university. While the external examiner is an expert in your field, like an, a laser focused person who has done exactly what you've been doing in your PhD for their entire academic career. Normally this means this person is terrifying to you. And it's this person's job to read your thesis and go through it with a toothpick and make sure they understand every figure, every equation, every page, and then talk to you about it and ask you why you made decisions, why you did certain things, why you didn't do certain things. The Viva can be kind of a protracted affair. Generally, they're a couple of hours long and it's just three of you in a room together, but they can be anything up to a whole day long. Somewhat depressingly, the two examiners are basically the only people that will ever read your thesis in its entirety, apart from maybe your supervisor, if you have a good supervisor. At the end of the Viva, you then walk away and sometime later you find out about your verdict. You either fail, and I'd like to point out that literally about 1% of PhDs who go for their Vivas fail, and most of those people haven't had touch with their supervisor for like a year. It's very rare to fail a Viva. Or you can get corrections, minor or major, basically means that, yeah, the work that you did was up to scratch, but there's a bit more that could be done. So if it's minor corrections, that more often than not just means like formatting of a figure or some spelling mistakes. If it's major corrections, that means that you have to do a bit more work and maybe do a bit more analysis. If it's minor corrections, that generally means it takes a couple of weeks, at most maybe, to fix everything. If it's major corrections, you're looking at a couple of months of work. Then lastly, if you're some kind of wonder child, you could get no corrections. I only know of one person that had no corrections, and I mean, he deserved it, he's a genius. But generally, most people aim for major or minor corrections. If you get minor corrections, it's the equivalent of like a stellar result. That's kind of what everybody hopes for, really. And then after that, you go to your graduation, you wear a floppy hat, you get to collect your degree, and you can call yourself doctor and have that sweet, sweet bank appointment where you go in and you say, I'd like to change the name of my account from Mr. to a doctor, please. Is that where anyone else does their PhD? It's kind of a reason why I'm doing mine. And that's it, congratulations, you are now a PhD. You've reached the top level of academic achievement. The kind of question of what you do next is a bit more difficult that I don't know the answer to, so don't ask me. I hope you enjoyed this video. It was kind of cathartic to make. It makes it seem like what I'm going to do is a bit less terrifying. Um, if you do have any questions about the PhD like process, then put them down there in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, please do give it a like. Oh, and if you do want to learn more about the process of kind of going through a PhD, I'm going to be regularly vlogging throughout this last part of my PhD, and you can come on the ride with me if you're up for that. If you'd like to do that, then there's a subscribe button down there. Thanks very much for watching.